Hello everyone, my name is Tim Lineman, and I want to welcome you to Philosophy 115, Critical Reasoning, Critical Thinking, I think it's Critical Thinking. I always talk about critical reasoning, so I might use those terms interchangeably, but um, in this video I want to introduce you to the class uh, and myself and to our Canvas site here and let you, take you around, uh, introduce you to everything that's going on and give you a, a sense for the vision of the overall class. Um, I will be doing some nuts and bolts stuff of like the course design, how the website's going to work, um, but also I'm going to talk about some bigger picture things that I'll be following up on with a lecture tomorrow. Um, so stay tuned. I'll give you more details about how these lectures are going to work too. Um, but first off, uh, first thing I want to say is um, about myself personally and what kind of instructor I am. Um, Maybe uh, if this is not your first uh, college class, or even if it is, pardon me, just having other teachers um, in school over the years, you probably know that people do things in a lot of different ways, and that's really pronounced in college, in my experience, that instructors have lots of different ways to do things, and especially that there can be differences between online classes and on in-person, on-campus classes. Um, and I've learned to overly advertise and emphasize um, my openness and my um, interest in talking with all of you, especially in an online class. This is very important to me. Um, but I will be, uh, you can actually see here, if you come to the um, Canvas website, on the home page here, it's got all the modules. And there is a little page here called your instructor's contact information. This is also going to be on the syllabus too. but. You'll be able to see uh, my phone number, my email addresses. Um, I definitely prefer phone. Uh, texting and calling is my number one preferred way of getting in contact with me. I also have this special Gmail uh, account that I've made just for my students. That's a great way to contact me too. It goes straight to my oversized phone. <laughs> I use this tablet as my phone. Um, so you can get in touch with me very easily this way. But I'm really big on... Um, being accessible to my students. Um, to me, it's what is the most important thing about being a teacher, honestly, if I'm sincere about that. I, I feel like the relational space here of how we work together cooperatively is one of the biggest defining variables for student success. And I want to be uh, here for you in every capacity that I possibly can, as much as possible, and as much as works for you. Um, I oftentimes uh, say to students, like, I want to be a part of this process as much as you're willing to let me be a part of the process. So um, one way I can put this is um, there's not a lot of things that uh, make me, like, they're pet peeves of mine as a teacher. Um, maybe you've had other teachers have, like, oh, I don't like this, I don't like this, complain about this, that, and the other thing. The only thing I really complain about with teaching is when students are uh, not contacting me and then I like maybe something happens and I talk to them and I'm like why didn't you tell me about this and they're like I didn't want to bug you that that is the really the only thing you have to be worried about with me um, that as like something you could do behaviorally or something that would like irk me would m mostly just be that, of like not thinking that you're free to contact me. Um, I'm here and always happy to talk to you. Working with students outside of normal business hours or outside of class spaces is my favorite thing about my job. And I really want you to believe me when I say that. And I'm not just saying that about some students, I'm saying that about every student. I've learned, in, I've been teaching for like 12 years now. and. Uh, I've gotten the sense that there's sometimes some students where it's like, um, oh, Tim might be talking about these students, but not me for X, Y, and Z reasons. And that's just not the case. Um, if you fall off the horse for any reason this quarter, um, whether it's something that you had control over or you didn't have control over, or that you think is like you've got legitimate excuses for or you don't have legitimate excuses for, I'm willing to work with you either way. Uh, that's a promise that you can take to the bank. Um, I'm always going to be looking for opportunities for you to get the most out of this quarter that you possibly can. Um, there can be hard limits sometimes, like if you checked out for two weeks, that might be pretty hard to recover from. Um, 
three weeks, four weeks, that might get to the point where like it might not be possible for you to pass the class. But even in those cases, I'm still in willing to invest in you and helping you get the most that you can uh, with your time with, with our course. So that's the most important thing I'd want to be able to communicate about myself. Um, I'm a little worried about my microphone level here. Let me pause the video really briefly. Sorry for the interruption here to just make sure everything's fine. Okay, everything's going good. I just got a little paranoid. <laughs> I give this whole lecture and then I have to re-record it. Okay, so that's the most important thing I'd want to say about myself right out of the gate. Another thing I can tell you, I can be really honest about here is, um, oh, 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 before I forget. So in terms of contacting me, a couple things to note. Um, one, uh, calling me in the evenings is absolutely fantastic, and weekends too. Don't worry about that. Um, I do. I have a three-year-old at home, so and my partner's a, a um, therapist, so we have to swap childcare responsibilities. Neither one of us is making enough money to be able to afford childcare, um, so we do this thing. I teach in the mornings, and then uh, they uh, they do their therapy clients in the evenings. So uh, I'm pretty busy until, or occupied uh, watching my child until when he goes to bed around 8 o'clock. So after 8 o'clock is like primo time for having phone call conversations, which I love to do. I'm usually having talks with students almost every day. Um, normally, I, that's, I think, the best. If I could talk to every single one of you every week in that kind of personal one-on-one -on -one way to see how things are going and answer any questions, et cetera, et cetera, um, I would love it. Um, it isn't completely practical to do that, but uh, try me out. Um, I mean, if I've got time, I'm giving it to you. So um, those are a great time for me, um, if that works for you. A lot of times people take online classes because they have to work too, so maybe evenings are the best time for you to talk about the class as well. Hopefully that works. Um, so that's one, one thing. Definitely feel free to call me late at night. Even after 10, I say here on the contact information, after 10, I might ignore you, but feel free to try me anyway. Um, I might be going to bed or something, but never worry about calling me. Uh, when I go to bed, I put my ringer on silent, so you're not going to wake me up or anything. So if you don't get me, you don't get me, and then I'll get back to you the next day as soon as I can. Um, but it never hurts to try. I'm a night owl of sorts, um, so I've been kind of burning. You can see some bags under my eyes. I've been burning the candle both ends recently. Um, but give me a try. Um, I really like talking during that time. So that's a good time for me. Weekends are okay too. Um, I'm not irked or annoyed by that or treated as disrespectful. If you if you got something that you think I can help you with, man, let me have that opportunity. I want to be able to be there for you. Um, the other thing about uh, getting a hold of me and meeting outside of class is I'm teaching an on-campus class this summer quarter. Um, from 8.30 to 10.30, Monday through Thursday. So if you're around on campus after 10.30, uh, Monday through Thursday, um, send me a text. We can meet up uh, in person. That would be really great. I'd love to be able to do things like that. Um, so uh, that's another option, too. Um, I'll usually be sticking around till at least 1.30, maybe 2.30 most days. Um, so that might be an option. Uh, there also is going, I'm going to be um, on campus giving, uh, uh, recording my video lectures for this class too actually on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 12.30 to 2.30. More on that in a second. I'll talk more about the, the lecture component to the course. But uh, bottom line, I want to be very accessible. I want you to use that open door sort of policy that I have as much as uh, it's valuable to you. And there's a lot of ways in which uh, putting more into this class you can get more out of it. So. Um, there's that. Um, okay, so next thing to talk about. Mm. All right, the other thing I can be honest about here about myself personally is that online teaching is not my favorite. Um, I definitely have done it, and I think I, I'm able to do it well. I like my course designs. I'm excited about teaching my online classes, but I really do prefer the in-person sort of face-to-face -face thing. And I, I really like online classes as primarily as a way in which students are able to get access to education where, where otherwise that might not be an option to be able to meet uh, um, on campus. But um, even despite that, I, um, I think that 
teaching is a very much a relational thing and the more in which that we have opportunities to have contact I think is to the good so um, I'm trying to design my I always try to design my online classes as much as possible to have more of that kind of personal touch this stuff is not canned I actually taught um, this class online before and I have video lectures up for it on my YouTube page and everything like um, have it all ready to go but I'm gonna be re-recording them this quarter because uh, I can get better in terms of my lectures and delivering the material and I want there to be uh, options for you to be able to um, interact with me about it and for me to adapt what I talk about based on where all of you are at you're always different I'm teaching very similar curriculum to what I've taught in the past but you're always different um, and I like to be able to meet you where you're at too so um, things like that are, are part of how I want to, this to be something less like a series of hoops to jump through um, and to be able to be along with you as you go on the journey of taking this class and going through the material and mastering all the techniques that we've got. So that's a, that's a little bit about myself. Um, as a philosopher, I'm, um, my main area of specialization is ethics. Um, my secondary one is cognitive science and philosophy of mind. Um, I have interests in uh, feminism and uh, gender theory is a big thing for me. Eastern philosophy. Um, personally, I identify about equal parts Lutheran and Buddhist. I don't that might be meaningful to you uh, to know that. If you ever want to talk about that, I'd be happy to. I'm not going to build that in the class, of course. Um, but the the big thing that does is relevant for how I teach this kind of a course, a critical thinking class, is the ethics component. And I'll talk about more about that in a second. Um, but if you have questions for me about like what I'm like as a person or as an instructor or anything like that, please uh, get on the horn with me. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Um, these first day kinds of lectures, I love being able to normally ask questions of students and have them ask questions of me. Our online format doesn't give us as much opportunity for that, but let's do it however we can. Um, I would very much welcome a call from you in the first week if, if you are so inclined. Um, but let's get into, let me kind of give you a tour of the, um, the website here, our Canvas site, talk about the different components of the class, do some review of the syllabus a little bit, and then we'll talk about some bigger picture things that are relevant to what we'll be doing this quarter. So, well, let me do a little a big picture thing here. What is this class all about? So uh, the philosophy department does not have a monopoly on logic or critical thinking. I mean, critical thinking is a universal skill set. And the way in which I've designed this class is definitely not tailoring it just for people who plan to major in philosophy or do philosophy at all, really. Um, I think that the skill set from this class is transferable to just about everything and just living life, being a human. Um, so uh, I think it's, it, it isn't just for philosophers. And I already kind of don't think that philosophy is just for philosophers either. I'm a big fan of saying philosophy is not just for the elite uh, intellectual geniuses or stuff like that. But this is something that um, can be valuable to everybody. I think everyone should take a little bit of philosophy um, as like a supplement to whatever else you're planning on doing with your life. Um, but uh, the philosophy department is offering logic classes and we have a formal logic class. That's philosophy 120. Um, that's called formal logic, I think. Um, yeah maybe deductive logic. I can't remember what it says on the books. I haven't taught it in a while. Um, but this class is the one that I've been teaching on, on the regular. This is informal logic. 115 critical thinking is all about informal logic. We're actually going to have a little primer on formal logic. Um, any of you who are programmers or have a math background are probably familiar with formal logic a little bit. It kind of looks like math. It's symbolic reasoning. Um, and we're going to do a little primer on that about halfway through the quarter. Um, but most of the class is about everything else that goes outside of formal logical parameters. Um, the class is mostly focused on uh, giving you skills and techniques that help you with understanding arguments, forming them yourself, and evaluating arguments. Those are the kind of main functions of what the class is all about. Um, but this, even though it's called informal logic, it's not loosey-goosey. The standards and are very high, very rigorous. And most of the class is about teaching you these, these analytic techniques that will empower you to do those three functions in a much more robust way than we do sort of intuitively. Um, 
a, a kind of a mantra for the class that I like to share is that um, this class is all about taking something fuzzy that's sort of implicit and making it as explicit as possible. And it'll, given the subject matter, the informality of informal logic, we're not going to be able to get it like perfectly crystal clear. But we're trying to get it like a little less fuzzy. We're trying to bring some clarity to something that's messy. I'm sure you've had some experiences like having discussions and debates with other people and and it can be a little bit like you can get lost, right? It can get confusing with all the stuff that's going on. And what we're trying to do is clarify all of that a little bit, give it some structure, give it some handholds so we know how to process it and make sense of it and evaluate it. And this class is going to be giving you a lot of hard tools for doing that. So I, I describe this as a, a skills class. Um, you, we are going to have exams that are going to test you on your mastery of these techniques that we're going to, I'm going to be lecturing on and we're going to be talking about sort of theoretically. Um, but a lot of informal logic is rooted in judgment calls that are, we're trying to make as informed as possible. Um, so you don't need a class like this to be competent in a lot of reasoning techniques. So it, it's not as if we're we don't understand this stuff and it's not until you take a class that you're like, oh, okay, now I can critically think or something. Um, but a lot of what we're going to try to do is take that implicit understanding, that implicit intuitive competency that you have and try to make it explicit so that we can um, do it better than we might do if we're just doing it through gut checks and, and, and intuition but also to be able to have some language to be able to communicate to each other so we can understand each other's way of thinking. Um, the communication aspect is a really big one for me. I think, I think it's one of the biggest things that taking this class can help you with, uh, is just communication skills. Um, so it's one thing for it to make sense up here, but can you share your thinking in a way that somebody else can, uh, maybe they don't agree with you, but they can at least understand what you're up to and what's going on up here. Um, so that we can work on these projects together, the the project of critical truth seeking. More on that soon. Um, sort of connected with some things I'm saying right now. A lot of this class is going to have this um, sort of uh, uh, model uh, procedure step, um, a kind of two-step process of step one, understanding ideas sort of intellectually like through reading the book and um, listening to my lectures, asking questions, clarifying questions, but sort of about things on the principled level, like definitions, concepts, principles, things like that. And then step two is taking those ideas and then wielding them in actual cases of analysis. That sort of application step is the other sort of follow through. And that gets really tricky. That, there's a lot of other things that happen that make this a difficult class that are not just on the level of understanding the ideals, but figuring out what to do with them, how to actually uh, implement them or apply them into cases to get a sort of evaluation or um, a particular result. So uh, I definitely encourage you to uh, take the homework very seriously. The homework is one of the best things about this class in order to prepare you for the exams where you'll have to do that stuff explicitly, um, directly. Um, but don't treat it as a hoop jumping thing. Getting the chance to try out your understanding and to test your competency uh, with those homework exercises is really important. And a lot of the class is going to be about you know, listening, trying to understand the ideas, getting clarification about that, asking questions when you need to. Um, Self-advocacy is very important in this class. Def that's why I want to be so accessible. Um, but then when you're like, okay, I have an understanding of this, taking a shot, applying it into like homework problems, seeing how it goes, and then diagnosing that, like like doing a post-mortem on your efforts, and then maybe having to recalibrate some things or reorient how you're applying it and how you're thinking about taking that concept and actually wielding it. Um, and making some adjustments about that. So making mistakes is a very natural, normal part of this process, and trying to learn from that and follow through on it, that's going to be part of um, the process that I think you should have the expectation for, and, and to not be afraid of. That, that's how this will work. Um, and there's a lot of things about the course design that fit in with that kind of model. So here's, let, let's just kind of look here. The homepage has the modules all set up here. 
We've got this getting started module. And then we're going to have all these other modules that are taken from different chapters of our text, um, understanding arguments. Um, the first chapter I'm going to just provide for you as a PDF, but you'll need to get the book one way or the other. Get it as cheap as you can. Um, don't worry about different editions because the homework assignments, I'll actually be giving you uh, scans from one of the editions so we're all on the same page with which problems we're doing. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but for reading the text, you'll want to uh, get the text. You can get it electronically too, and you can uh, actually buy it kind of chapter by chapter. So we're only going to be doing some of the chapters out of the text. So you can just kind of get the ones that you need. Um, we'll be doing two, three, um, five, six, and then eight, nine, and ten. Um, but that's all in these modules. But let, let's look at the chapter two module here as a good example of how this is going to go. So there's going to be a reading from the textbook. Um, I will have video lectures. Um, these are the old ones from the site before. I'll be replacing them with the new ones that I'll be recording as we go. I'll talk more about those in a little bit. Um, there's going to be codes here. These are like little quizzes. In the video lectures, I'll give out code words that you'll put into the quizzes here to prove that you watch the video as sort of makeshift attendance for the class. Um, but uh, that's what that's all about. I'll have lecture notes here that I would recommend downloading and maybe even having up while I, as you watch the lectures. I'll be posting them. The lectures are going to be visible on the screen too while I'm recording my video lecture. Um, but if you're attending live, which there will be an option for, you might pull this up to follow along as we go. Um, there might be some extra little supplements here, like here's a little diagram that I've offered. And then there's a homework assignment and a place for you to upload your answers. Um, and then uh, here's some extra homework problems here. Um, yeah, uh, for extra practice if you wanted more. I'll also be posting the answers to the homework after the due date is, uh, we've gotten past the due date for the homework, that you've done it on your own. And I'm going to be finding some ways about how we might be able to emulate the way in which I'd have on-campus classes for us to talk through the homework together in person, try to find some way to do this online. More on that later. I'll talk more about that later. But then after, um, so this is the first step in which you'll want to like respect the homework, get some practice at it, see how it goes, look at my answers, see if there's some big disconnects, talk with me, use some of the opportunities I'm going to make available for us to check in about it together, um, and then on to the next batch of material. And then we'll have these periodic exams. There are three exams for the quarter. Um, they'll be delivered online. Uh, you'll have 24 hours to complete them. You will not need 24 hours to complete them, but I wanted to give a big chunk of time so that if any questions pop up while you're taking the exam, there'll be time for you to contact me, ask those questions, get a reply from me, uh, and it's all comfortable. Um, I always have felt, even when I've done this class in person, that it's weird to take an exam like this under the gun of the time pressure because uh, when you're under time pressure, you don't think as critically. <laughs> the whole class is about critical thinking. So I want to give you the time to like give it your best answer. Really think things through to be careful in your analysis and not feel under the gun. Um, you can take breaks. You know, you can step aside from it, go on a walk, get some food, you know, do what you have to, um, and then complete it. But these are not intended to be open book exams. I do intend for you to take the exam with integrity. Uh, and what that means is to pretend like you're in a classroom, quiet, don't have your notes, don't have your book, can't talk to people, you're not supposed to work on these together, and, and take the exam. You can take the breaks and stuff, of course, and contact me with questions, but that's the intention for these exams. And then the other kind of element of how there's this take a stab at it, see how it goes, diagnose it, do the postmortem recalibrate, try again, um, there will be makeup exams for exams one and two. Um, not for the third one. I'll talk about that here in a second. Sorry, I keep saying that. Um, but after you get exam one graded, um, we'll be able to take a look at how you did and see what stuff went well and what stuff didn't go well. And then there's a chance to redo sections of the original exam with different problems, but the same types of problems. Um, and uh, this is modular, so if some sections of the exam went fine, you don't want to redo them, that's okay. If others didn't go well and you want to redo them, you'll be able to do the ones that you want to redo. 
Um, so this is another big way in which I've tried to build this, maybe you've heard this phrase from teachers like growth mindset pedagogy into the class. That, yeah, you're, you're not going to master this stuff immediately. Um, it takes some trial and error. It takes some processing and learning from your mistakes. And, and I want to be a part of that process with you. And I encourage you to have patience with yourself about this too. Um, the, the makeup exams, the sections that it lets you redo, will then, if you get a higher score on that re, the makeup section than on the original exam, I'll take that score and replace the portion of your original exam with your higher score. So these I've seen amazing things happen with. I've seen students go from F's to A's with these makeup exams. So if it's not coming to you right away, don't panic. Um, reach out to me. Like I said, self-advocacy, really big in this class. It's, this is a tough class. I know it's a 100 level class. You may be not thinking it's going to be too intimidating, but this material is tough, and we're going to cover a lot of material, and especially during summer quarter when everything is going so fast because it's abbreviated. Um, you don't want to fall off the pony. Um, and if you are feeling a little shaky about it, get in touch with me so we can, we can um, get you some support and help. And even if you're not, you're not feeling like you're struggling, like the, it's not like the only time to contact me is if things are going bad with the grade. Um, I'm, I'm here for you no matter what. And I'm always interested in investing in you if you want to invest more in the class to get something more out of it. It's, I like to talk about it kind of like um, when a corporation's doing like a charity drive and they talk about like matching donations. So if you donate, they're going to match your donation. That's how I, I feel about like my own time and my own energy. That if, if I have a student who like wants to invest more in this, they, they want to shoot for higher academic goals and ambitions, man, I want to be there willing to like match what they're willing to put on the table. So um, I'm going to do that to my absolute utmost. That's another promise. So this is going to be the kind of schedule of the class. Um, reading, watching video lectures, doing homework, debriefing the homework, preparing for the exams, taking the exams, getting them graded, recalibrating, do a makeup exam. That's going to be the rhythm here for most of the quarter through the first two exams. Um, and before I talk about the last section, let, let's talk about the sort of curriculum content. So after we get through this first introductory unit, which is admittedly a little goofier than the rest of the quarter, so don't get, don't take this first unit um, as a, a model of how everything's going to look. We're, I'm going to talk about some pretty big picture stuff, stuff that's a little more philosophical um, and theoretical rather than the nuts and bolts of these analytic tools that we're going to be devoting most of the quarter to. But once we hit that in stride here with chapter two, everything leading up to the first exam is all about listening. And that's it. And I always have some students who are like jumping the gun, they're chomping at the bit to get to like evaluating arguments, like being able to detect what's bullshit from what holds water. Um, but we're, we're going to have to hold our horses on that. I think listening is very, very important. You cannot evaluate something you don't understand. Um, and there's a lot of critical thinking that's just at the level of figuring out what is someone really saying? What is the logic of their argument? And tracking that. And that sets us up to be able to do the evaluative stage in a much more effective way. Even if all you're doing is having just an informal conversation with someone, like face to face, and just talking through something. Um, you have to figure out what they're really about, like what's their position and why do they think it's true? What are their arguments in support of it before you can really dive productively into uh, evaluation. So the, everything leading up to exam one is just about listening. And it culminates in this extended argumentative analysis where you're basically going to break down what someone's argument is and show the structure of it and all the claims that are involved in it, et cetera. So that's everything leading up to exam one. Exam two, everything in this second big chunk, which is the uh, is going to start with this formal logic, the formal evaluation um, of arguments unit. Um, that's our crash course in symbolic logic, which we'll be doing. Uh, we're, we're also going to do the inductive stuff. So deduction and induction are actually two different things in logic, um, and so they're, they're they're they come down to. I don't want to give away too much of a lecture here, but um, when we're evaluating arguments, there are really just two standards for what it takes to have a good argument. So an argument is just any time you've got a claim supported by at least one other claim. The claim getting support is called the conclusion. 
the claim the claimer claims that are giving the support that are making the argument are the premises so an argument is a connection between claims it's this support connection or right? what I'll call the support relation so to have a good argument you really just need two things one your premises need to be true if you're reasoning on faulty premises you know that's no good um, and I think that's one that's pretty intuitive and most of us already are tracking the second standard though is the one that sometimes flies under the radar and that is in short that the argument needs to have a good support relation that's pretty vague what do we mean by a good support relation uh, well we have two different standards for how to understand that um, where is the bar sort of set there on evaluating the logical connection between the premises and the conclusion um, in an informal way I could say this is all about if I accept the premises as being true what sort of force does that have on leading me to the conclusion so when we say the conclusion follows from the premises that's alluding to how there's this this inferential connection between the claims of the premises and the claim of the conclusion that they're attempting to justify one of the standards that we have for evaluating this is validity and that's what deductive formal logic is all about the other standard is strength um, inductive strength and that's what we'll be doing with the chapter 8 9 10 unit here with inductive reasoning so um, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about this later so if this isn't making a ton of sense right now I'm just giving kind of a really quick overview of this we'll talk a lot more about it later but in short an argument being valid um, the standard of validity is what we have in mind when we say there's a proof for something like an absolute guarantee that the conclusion is true um, no wiggle room no way out if you accept the premises you have to accept the conclusion you have no other option that is what a valid argument looks like in this early informal sketch I'm providing we're gonna have much more technical definitions for it that we'll look at later um, inductive reasoning in short or this standard of inductive strength is basically saying if I accept the premises uh, as true then I have really good reason to think the conclusion is true but maybe short of an absolute guarantee and that's still really valuable to us and I'll talk a lot more about why that's so important um, but basically all of science is inductive we don't get absolute proofs for things in science no matter how sometimes people talk about it uh, I'll actually be doing some extended stuff about science in this unit which will be fun we'll do a little philosophy of science along the way um, but uh, yeah inductive strength is like the premises being true makes the conclusion more probable not an absolute proof but it's more weight for thinking that that's the most justified position to take on on the, whatever question we're debating so this whole second uh, chunk of the class leading up to exam two is all about evaluating arguments um, so that's what it's about and then the final section of the class is a little shorter um, and not as intense uh, I've tried to kind of have exams one and two be the biggies because then there's still time to do a makeup exam this last unit there won't be time for a makeup exam we'll have exam three but what we're gonna do in this unit is talk about the informal fallacies and these are really fun and I like ending with them not only to like land the plane a little softly here for you instead of how quarters in college usually are like web finals and then crash you know like the culminating high pressure sort of thing um, this way we can kind of like ease down but this is still a challenging unit I mean it don't sleep on it but um, the fallacies I like to close with because they're so practical you can plug and play them into your life to great effect almost immediately um, what are they uh, the informal fallacies are basically a listing like a index almost like a encyclopedia of um, classic argumentative reasoning mistakes they're they're problematic ways of uh, forming arguments or behaving in a debate some of them are more behavioral than um, a matter of the like concepts of or the logic involved with the arguments themselves um, but they're just like little mistakes that we make that are either so pernicious or common or um, tricky to avoid intuitively or nasty just like straight up nasty um, that we we want to label them we want to name them so we can track them so we have them on the radar um, and we can avoid 
doing them ourselves, like engaging in those mistaken patterns of reasoning and, and arguing ourselves, but also to be able to detect it when other people are doing it. And to not be, a, a lot of the fallacies involve tricks or mm, underhanded techniques of like say rhetorical debate, like what politicians use all the time, that are not actually making good arguments, but make something sound good or look good. They can persuade even if they don't rationally justify. Um, so being able to, they're, they're, a lot of it is about bullshit and detecting bullshit. Um, this will help your bullshit detector, uh, this unit. Um, but I also, uh, the, w the thing I bring to the table on this unit that's a different from some other classes I've seen is these fallacies oftentimes threaten the ability of people to engage in productive, positive, cooperative, truth-seeking in debate. Um, debate spaces can be can get pretty nasty, as I'm sure you've experienced in your life. Like when people disagree about things and are arguing with each other about it, there's so many ways that that can be unproductive, um, unethical, uh, like disrespectful, uh, harmful, um, and yeah, just all around bad. And it doesn't have to be that way. And when someone uses some of these fallacies, that are the nastier sorts of ones that threaten the ability of that interaction space to be a positive, productive one, it can be difficult to get things back on track. Um, maybe you can, even with my informal description here, you can think of some memories of this happening to you about how to like restore or repair that relational space that you're having with that person and have it be something that is worth spending time on um, and isn't, isn't something that starts to get uh, ethically problematic. I'll talk a lot more about that. This is what I was alluding to about how I bring an ethical com uh, lens to thinking about critical thinking. Um, I'll, I'll be saying a lot more about that in this first week, so maybe I can hold off on that for now. I, I don't want to get this video too long, this introductory video. We'll have very long lectures coming soon enough. Um, but this is, this is really practical, very useful stuff to just like apply right into your life. Um, and we'll will help you a lot, I think, in not just your studies, um, but in lots of interpersonal relational spaces with friends, with family, with colleagues, uh, peers, group projects, your coworkers, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not just for academics. So that's a brief overview of everything in the class and kind of the, the flow of it. Um, I will be uh, updating the kind of calendar and when the due dates are going to be happening for these different aspects to the class as we're going through it. Um, I am going to be recording all these video lectures live uh, as we go through the quarter and we'll kind of see how fast we're moving through things and if people are asking lots of questions about stuff maybe I think well we should slow down a little bit. Um, and some of these units take a little bit more time, a little bit less time. Summer quarter is always weirder too because I can't I go in the usual like, oh, we should take about a week on this because weeks don't have the same metrics anymore when you're online uh, or um, during summer quarter. So we'll feel it out. Um, but I, I'm not worried about us running out of time for anything. I've gotten really good at pacing this class. Uh, and, and it's sort of built in where we've got a little buffer time to spend on this, that, and the other thing if we need more time with some things. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's what you can kind of expect here. Um, I'm going to take a little short break here. I'm just going to pause the video and I'll be right back. Sorry for the break. I just need to get some more water. Okay. So I want to go into a little more detail here about different components of the class that I just gave the broad overview about. Um, so, man, this is a time I love on-campus classes. Being able to be like, any questions? How's things going? But just got to talk into a box today. Speaking of, let's talk about that first. Let's talk about the video lectures here in more detail. So, um, actually, since the time that I did, I did this class online three years ago. And since then, I've, I've kind of updated my way of handling video lectures in a way that I, I think really works. Um, and it, it's got all the advantages of the old way of doing things, but some new extra opportunities, which are really cool. And that I, I want to kind of also expand a little bit this time around and see if I can't um, make it even more effective in terms of giving you more chances to relate. Um, so I'm not just talking into a box. So the big change that I've started doing with my online classes when I teach them is to have the video lectures delivered live. 
So uh, it's not just me recording a video and then uploading it and then you watch it. Um, but that there's an option here for you to be in a chat room, so doing a, a video chat thing that then I'm recording while it's happening. So you could show up and ask questions like on the spot, like I'm, I'm giving a lecture, I'm explaining some stuff, and anyone who's in the video chat is capable of like typing in or using a microphone and, and raising questions. Um, and then I can like answer them right away. And that's really good because um, I try to anticipate student questions and possible areas of confusion as much as I can. And I've taught this class dozens of times at this point. So I've got a, a good sense of the general lay of the land. But you never know. And er all of you are in a very different position um, with respect to the curriculum we're going to be covering. I, in fact, of all the classes that I teach, this is probably the one where I see the most diversity of what students bring to the table. And what might be a challenging unit for you might be really easy for the another person in the class and then the next week totally flipped. Um, everyone comes to the table with very different skill sets when it comes to critical reasoning and strengths in one area, weaknesses in another and that's just that's just part of how it goes. So um, it's always good for there to be some kind of opportunity for me to get feedback of how you're all doing and where you're at with the material and what I can address or try to explain in some different ways or give you more access points to. So the more that we can get that kind of dynamic built into this online class, the better. So I'm looking for every opportunity I can. And one of those is by doing these lectures live. So my plan right now, and hopefully we'll be able to stick to this a whole quarter, is that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, from 12.30 to 2.30, so the kind of two-hour block emulating the amount of time we m might normally have, um, I'll be trying to get these uh, video lectures out. Um, and I may have to supplement with some more lectures, which I might record on the weekends, um, and which we wouldn't do live, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to get some schedule that, I, that we can stick to so you know what to plan for if you're trying to attend these things uh, live and in person. Um, weekends we might be able to do this on sort of an ad hoc basis and if you're able to show up cool and if not it'll still be recorded um, so that you can watch it later. Um, but that's the sort of that's the dream setup uh, as far as I'm concerned is is being able to um, have something that you can count on so you can show up if you can. Um, whenever I've done this in the past not everyone's able to. I understand about schedules and stuff especially if you're taking online classes because you're working 12.30 to 2.30 is not the best time for that. Usually I like to do lectures in the evenings, but this quarter um, it's not going to work out like I was mentioning with my partner and their therapy practice. Uh, we're just not going to be able to make multiple sessions a week happen in the evening. So this is kind of the best thing I've been able to come up with um, for a, a time that can work. And hopefully that will work for some of you and we can get some of that uh, critical mass happening um, live uh, when we are um, in person together, uh, sort in, 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 through the internet, right? Um, but if you can't make it, they are going to be recorded. I'll be uploading them to YouTube. Um, you can watch them there. I'll be putting the links in here. Um, so all these little links, you see video lecture part one of two, part two of two, this kind of stuff. Um, so I'll be, uh, I'll be recording these videos and posting them. You can watch them at your convenience and then put in the code to you know, show that you watched them through these little quizzes. The other thing I'm trying to get ambitious with this quarter to see if it's at all possible is to maybe set up some uh, extra sessions, and this is what we might do with weekend sessions too, where I, normally when I teach this class on campus in person, I have devoted days that are just homework review days, where I just show up to class and people talk about the homework problems that gave them trouble and we diagnose it together and figure out what recalibrations need to happen. And the more we could do something like that here in this online session, I, I think that'd be awesome. So um, I might be able to do some of that. If we're getting a lot of people attending my normal live times, then maybe we can just seamlessly integrate that into those video lectures. It might be something that we need to do um, uh, on a sort of ad hoc basis at um, uh, on the weekends or something like that. So. Um, that might be playing it by ear a little bit about how we work that out. But let's see what goes on. Um, at the very least, I want to say, no matter what sort of formal thing I'm able to craft as a part of the course design here, 
um, that self-advocacy bit about like reaching out to me and asking me about the questions that you have on just an individual basis, absolutely do this. Absolutely. Um, I want to help you with that as much as I possibly can. And I can't, I'll, like I said, I'll be trying to anticipate as best I can. Um, but you're the, you're, you're the person you are. And I, every quarter I, I'm surprised and there's something new that I didn't anticipate. And it's from having rapport with students and being accessible that I've learned that's how I get to have that knowledge. And then I can build it into my lectures and be a more effective teacher um, for you and for all the future students who take this class from me. So um, I'm in this for the long haul and I, I'm, I'm very passionate and invested in the quality of my education. Uh, my teaching and uh, you helped me with that so I, I appreciate in advance you uh, reaching out and um, using that time and, and giving me that opportunity okay so uh, what else is there anything else about the video lectures I think that's it I think that's it about that um, the homework so the way the homework is going to work is you'll have assigned exercises out of the book um, and I will, and you'll upload them here, like you can see here in this module, um, right here, homework for chapter two. You'll upload your homework answers, and if you've done them, I give you credit. They're not graded. They're just like, it's pure like practice. It's just participation is what matters here for the homework. Because I know it's going to be a process, and this stuff won't make sense. Maybe it, Maybe it makes sense for you right away. Maybe it doesn't. More likely it won't. And it'll take some practice and retooling to, to get to that level of mastery with it. Really, the curriculum that we're covering this quarter is not something you can master in seven weeks. I mean, these are skills. The skills we're going to be developing are skills you'll spend your whole life uh, mastering and getting better with. So uh, I'm understanding about that, about how the class, class is set up. And, but I want you to have that expectation, too. I think that's a good one to come into the class with, um, being prepared for that. Um, but it, I know this is going to be a part of the process, so I don't grade the homework uh, performatively. But you will get answers from me posted where, and I've actually, at, at this point teaching the class, I've stopped using the instructor's manual, and I've written my own answers to all of the homework problems. So they're coming straight from me. So if something doesn't make sense in my homework answers, you can blame this guy. But I thought, you know, especially since I'm the one designing your exams, you probably want to see ideal answers from the person who's grading your exams. So that's what you're going to get. And hopefully we'll have these chances to review it together too. But um, even though this is just a like do it and you get credit, don't treat it like a hoop jumping thing. Th like I was saying earlier, this is one of the most valuable aspects of the class in terms of you learning and, and developing a, this mastery and preparing for the exams themselves. Um, there is going to be a little writing assignment extra project for leading up to the first exam, and maybe we'll have time for some more. Usually we don't, but I'm always hopeful, hope springs eternal, uh, in building out more writing assignments as part of the class. But most of the class is not about like writing essays or something. Um, it's really about um, more analytic techniques here of, of uh, analyzing and evaluating stuff. Um, and then we, I've described how the exams will work. So. Um, that's the basic flow of the class. And if you want to be working ahead, um, I'm not, I'm not going to be sort of structuring the Canvas site like that where you can just kind of plow through it. I don't think that that's a good way to learn this material. You can't like binge it, <laughs> so don't try. Um, I really encourage you not to do that. Um, same thing goes with video lectures. I think I said something on the syllabus this time around like, uh, don't don't treat it like binge watching Netflix or something like that's not the best way to learn this stuff. A little bit every day is is the much better way to like absorb it. Um, so uh, same thing with like gearing up like doing all the stuff right up for an exam deadline. Not the best way to approach this class. If you've got concerns about that, if you're like my life situation does not afford me the opportunity to do this on the regular, and you're already planning that you're like I'm gonna have to binge work on this class, let's talk about that. I would, I would make that request. I'd like to talk to you about how that can be set up in the best possible way if it really has to happen, but I really discourage that kind of approach to the class. I just don't think it's uh, effective for students, and the students that have done it that way in the past, um, it, 
it just doesn't work as well. I've seen the performance, um, and it and it's uh, not a statistical good bet <laughs> to do it that way. Um, but I'm always willing to adapt this class as is needed to fit with your needs too. So at any time, if there's something that's not working for you, or you think it's there, you anticipate some trouble or difficulty, please let me know, and let's talk. Let's have that conversation. Um, I also uh, let's let's go through some of the other aspects to the site here. There is a calendar, and I will be posting due dates, so that's a good way to take a look at what's going on. But what I'm would more encourage is uh, I will be sending out weekend update emails every week on Fridays, maybe Saturday mornings sometimes, but probably mostly Fridays. Um, that are is going to let you know about like where we're at in the class and what's coming down the pipe for the next week. And I try to make those weekend update emails like one-stop shopping for the whole class. So I know it's very tempting in an online class to just treat the the Canvas site as like the end-all and be-all of your class participation. But important warning here, don't do that. Um, please uh, uh, read my emails. Um, take a look at what's going on. I try to explain things and make it all as clear as possible for you so you know what's going on and that you can track on your own self sort of like what's coming up and what your responsibilities are rather than waiting for Canvas to like poke you to do something all the time like you have a deadline tomorrow kind of thing. Um, you want to anticipate this stuff as much as possible. Being a proactive student is, is useful for a class like this. Um, there will be, uh, I don't have any discussions posted right now, but uh, this can be another forum for uh, how people can ask questions about homework and things like that. Uh, I'll be reviewing this as, as much as I can and staying on top of giving replies to people, so feel free to start your own discussion threads asking questions about things. Treat it like a Reddit um, forum about like critical reasoning stuff, and I'll be like the moderator and try to answer all of your questions as much as I can. But if, if doing things like talking on the phone is not as viable, um, this might be another another access point for how you can get contact from me and get your questions answered and all that good stuff. Um, and then there's the syllabus here. Um, I will be sending out um, a post about this too, uh, as like the first email. I'll, I'll, so the I guess because of the online version of the class, I won't have all your. Usually, I, have, I collect student emails and then send them out emails. So um, the weekend update emails are not per se emails, but um, I'll be posting them in the announcements section. So there will be an announcement here soon that's like the welcome to the class, here's an introductory announcement sort of thing. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and so yeah, announcements, assignments, uh, discussions, um, and then modules is really, this is the main place for everything that's happening with the class. but. Um, uh, and I will be posting deadlines for all these things. Yes. Okay. So that's a lot of the nuts and bolts of everything. Um, let me pull up here. Here's the course syllabus. Please read the syllabus too. Like this introductory video will help you getting acclimated to the class. But please take a look at this. I know it's so easy to just gloss over the syllabus and not take a look. But please read this. Um, I've written it specially for you. And I've said things here I want to say. Um, the way the class really breaks down grading-wise is... Half your points are just given to you on a silver platter. Um, only 50% of your grade is evaluated. Um, and I used to, I've, I've been teaching this way for a long time. I really like this format um, of having it split in this kind of ratio. Um, but what I've found is like, um, what I think is a gift to students doesn't always work out that way. If you fall behind with attendance, homework, that actually ends up biting you more usually than the exams will. Like students don't usually fail the class. Um, well, I, when I've seen students fail the class, what's usually happened? Yeah, there's been some pretty bad exam performances, but it's usually also coupled with them just like not showing up and not doing the homework and that biting them. Um, usually those things are connected in my experience. I think if you watch all the video lectures uh, on a regular schedule, not binging it, and you're doing the homework, and you're asking questions when you've got them or trying to diagnose and compare your answers against my answers and sort out anything that looks wacky there, I think it's really hard to not succeed in this class. Um, there's, I've never had a student that I've 
put time in work where they put time in it and we've invested in trying to like work things out and they failed. I've never seen that happen. And it's not just because I've got like an easy grading scale or something. It's because they actually have picked it up. If you're feeling like, oh, this isn't really my thing, like I'm not a philosopher, I'm not very intellectual or something like that, I'm not much of a critical thinker, I don't like to debate with people or do that kind of thing, um, you can you can succeed in this class. I feel very confident about making a promise like that. And I'm willing to back up that promise with my investment and and the sort of personal challenge to kind of prove it to you. I really want to have the chance to do that. Um, you, you can definitely succeed with this. And if it's feeling like it's not or you've got any anxieties or concerns about it, come and talk to me and let's, let's have that chat. I would very much appreciate that. Um, I describe all the assignments here and the tests. And here's, um, this, is, this uh, is really just a listing of what the modules have going on to on Canvas. And then there's all the BC po policies here. Um, the, the one thing that really jumps out to me about academic conduct, so I mentioned how these uh, exams are delivered online and the, I don't, um, I'm, they're intended to be taken with the kind of integrity conditions like I was talking about. But I've, there's a trade-off here. Um, I'm not able to police this um, almost at all. And usually what I've seen from other instructors is their strategy is to have that time limit on the exam so that you, um, you, have to know, you have to know your stuff going into it to be able to do everything in the time allotted. And that helps to cut down on some of the like cheating things that can happen, like working on it with another person or looking stuff up on the internet or through your book or looking over your homework assignments, all that kind of stuff. And I'm not operating that way with it. Um, like I said, I'm giving you 24 hours. So I'm not availing myself of that kind of mechanism to try to ensure integrity here. Um, but I'm willing to take that risk and take that gamble um, because I want a better experience for you as the student. So I hope that you think about that in making choices with integrity and not cheating on the exams. Um, I know it sounds kind of like weak for me to just say like, please don't cheat, please don't cheat, but I'm really doing that. And I'd rather err on the side of that than being a cop about this or trying to police it in a more aggressive way that makes for a worse experience for everybody. Um, I, I stand by that kind of choice, but um, Really, this class, you don't, hopefully the way I got it set up with the grades, like, you don't need to cheat to succeed. If you're feeling desperate about that, talk to me. I mean, like I was saying a minute ago, like, we can do something about it. You don't have to cheat yourself out of uh, a more robust educational experience. Um, I really hope to prove to, it, to you this quarter how this curriculum it can be something more than just getting your five credit hours to graduate kind of thing or satisfying a course requirement or something like that. Um, I think this class has a lot to offer uh, life and you as a person. So I hope it's worth it to you to take this class seriously and take it sincerely um, and apply yourself to it and with integrity. So I need to say that. Um, so that's about academic conduct. Um, and uh, I do recommend taking a look at this Arts and Humanities Commitment to Student Growth and Development. This is a uh, wording and document that the Arts and Humanities Division uh, put together a couple years ago. And I really like a lot of what's on here. Hopefully I do something more over and above just what's even listed here in terms of aspirations for uh, teaching quality. Um, but I definitely agree with what's here. And this is part of my commitment to you too as your instructor. Um, but bottom line, in general, I'm always willing to work with you and trying to make the best experience that for this quarter that you can possibly have. Okay, so there's that. Um, in this first week, um, getting into some bigger picture stuff about the class that I was promising earlier. I mentioned how the first intro unit here is going to look a little different from the rest of the course. And that's because there's some big picture stuff that I think is really important for framing up how we understand the curriculum from this class. I've seen a lot of informal logic classes or critical thinking classes taught as sort of a like, here's the rules, here's how logic works, here's the standards, here's where the bar's set. Um, 
so you know now you know and play by the rules and all that kind of stuff and I, I think there's something um, inaccurate or that gives a wrong impression about things and also doesn't is not as supportive to students who are trying to pick this up as it otherwise could be one thing I'm really fond of saying here is that critical thinking is a an ethical paradigm it's not like learning how to operate an ultrasound machine or learning the rules of algebra or something like that. Um, there's something more robust happening here. If I was teaching this class in person, um, I'd spend a day in this first week where we talk about, I do a little class discussion activity where I'm like, um, what are the things that you consider to be advantages and risks of approaching life with a critical attitude and uh, employing rationality or leaning on reason as a way to make decisions about what to think and how to act. Which is basically what critical reasoning is for. It's a, like I said, an ethical paradigm that's trying to give you guidance about how you ought to live in what you're going to believe and how you're going to act. Like ethical choices about behavior, how am I going to, what is the best thing for me to do here? And just the belief part about like how I understand the world. What do I think is going on? What do I think is true? So the true and the good. Very classic ideas from philosophy. The true and the good. That's what Plato's always talking about. The true and the good. Um, and there's other ways that we have of making those decisions about what to believe and how to act. Other than to do it with a critical attitude and relying on the tools of rationality. Um, and I think it's good for us to be critical about to critically think about critical thinking. And that's what this discussion would be all about. Um, I don't, uh, maybe you've heard the adage, um, to someone with a hammer, everything is a nail. And sometimes logicians kind of work that way too. I love critical reasoning as a paradigm. I think it's a very uh, good life philosophy. But it isn't always the right tool for the job. Um, I like to say also, students often have heard me said. Um, sometimes people don't need arguments, they need a hug. Maybe that's the right way to deal with something rather than like giving it a breakdown of like, here's what, everything that's wrong with your per position or perspective. Like, maybe that's not the right way to deal with things or to have a critical debate. It's not the right time for that. There's something else to do instead. I, I do think that critical thinking and critical debate spaces are extremely powerful and a lot more um, useful and ideal as a way to go about this stuff than sometimes people give it credit for. Um, I'll be basically trying to paint that vision over the next couple lectures here for you, um, looking at this thing called the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I'll talk about that in my lecture tomorrow. Um, but it still has its limits too, and it's good for us to go into it with like our eyes open about that. Um, I, I don't want this class to turn into a brainwashing thing. So like I said, there's, there's other ways to make decisions about what to believe and how to act other than to do it through critical thinking. And I think sometimes the way critical thinking classes are taught is really just like that. Like, this is the way to do things, people. This is the right way to live. I like to be more honest about it and say, this is an ethical choice. You've got other ways to do this. Why do you want to do it through critical thinking? And to own up to that. So actually, I have a, something called the intro lecture document here posted on there. I'm actually not planning on lecturing through this. I used to use this ages ago. I've kept it up there. I've replaced it with some other stuff, but I've kept it up here for you to take a look at. And for our class, where we're not going to have that discussion day, um, here you can see some answers students have given me in the past about the sort of good and bad here about being critical or relying on rationality. Um, and th these, the concerns are good ones to have on the radar. Um, and and the, uh, the good things are also worth having on the radar. And it's not all good and all bad. There's opportunities for taking critical reasoning and going in a good way with it, or maybe a problematic way. Um, here are some of the functions that I have in mind for why critical reasoning is useful, um, what purpose you might apply it to, like what ethical projects is it the right tool for the job for. So the first two I've already mentioned, but just especially adjudicating conflict and getting to a place of consensus like true agreement, not just um, a coercive yes, but an authentic yes that two people might make when they agree about something. 
Um, just even sharing your experiences or opinions with others, even if it doesn't get to a whole lot of critical evaluation of does that make the most sense, critical thinking tools are still useful for just good listening. Curiosity, self-awareness, I think there's a lot of emotional health things that go on here. Um, finding new solutions like innovation, there's just a lot of reasons why this is good. But can we get the good without the bad? That's the real question here, right? So there are some good purposes for critical thinkings, but also ways for it to be destructive and anti-productive. Um, so what would we have to do to get the good without the bad? That's going to set up the code of intellectual conduct. Um, so, and oh, just as a side note here, the rest of the document, my, this is from my friend James uh, from grad school, James Gibson, who's now a programmer. He's not a philosopher anymore. Uh, he went into programming. Um, this is a fun story, but he's an interesting person. I enjoyed uh, my years spent with him. But this is taken from his critical thinking class, and uh, I have this note about that. He's a little, uh, I could say, harsher about some of this stuff than me, but the way he likes to frame up his class is to talk about the things that keep us from critically reasoning. He talks about relativism, um, egocentrism, intimidation by authority, conformism, ethnocentrism, being unreflective, and then talks about these intellectual virtues that are sort of the antidotes to those problems that hijack critical thinking or make us avoid it entirely. I'm going to be going in with a little different angle, but if you want to take a look at James's ideas here, I don't think it's bad. I'm still making it available to you, but don't treat this as mandatory. But it's there if you want to take a look at it. Where I'm going to take it is jumping off on this, how do we get the good without the bad? So, um, as I was alluding to earlier, my guess is, at this point in your life, you've had bad experiences with debate, of people in critical disagreements with each other, um, and differences of perspective, and making arguments, and it turning into fights, and people yelling at each other, and engaging in straw man arguments, and personal attacks, ad hominem attacks. I mean, the kind of toxic stuff that you see on YouTube comments, uh, or discussion boards on the internet all too frequently. Um, I it, I love teaching this class. It seems to just get more relevant with every passing year with the way our culture is moving. But I'll be completely honest with you. Um, for me, uh, I really like teaching this class because I, I have a little bit of an agenda. And my agenda is, I, I want to put all my cards on the table here. Um, my agenda is to try to heal debate spaces. Um, and I think the Code of Intellectual Conduct gives us some vision or direction about how we can do that. Um, I think most of the time, uh, debate is a competition. It's antagonistic. Uh, it's take no prisoners. It's defeat your opponent. It's about us and them and enemies and this kind of thing. Defensiveness. Um, the attacks, all that kind of stuff. Writing people off, dismissing them, not listening to each other. like. All these things, boiling down to competitive. It's competitive and antagonistic. And I think that I could sum up a lot of what I'm going to say in this in these first few lectures by just saying, like, it makes all the difference in the world when you flip the script on debate being a competitive activity to being a cooperative one. <clears throat> I think even if you and your conversational partner are or your opponent uh, don't agree on anything else, you can still be cooperatively aligned if you're aligned, you're on the same side of the issue of finding out what is the truth, to be truth seekers. And by truth, we could also mean, I'll talk more about this in my next lecture, the search for what is the most rationally defensible position. So what makes the most sense? Like, you've got options about what to believe. How are you going to use that freedom? How are you going to use that cho choice space? What you initially believe or what you find intuitive may be the right answer. It also might not be the right answer. Like under investigation, under analysis, it might turn out to not be the best, and maybe someone else has a better idea. That happens. And for us to be able to learn and grow and develop in our understanding means going through this kind of critical process with it. But it doesn't have to be so nasty. It doesn't have to be... Uh, something that requires him this super thick skin. I'll say a lot more about this in my next lecture. But this is where it's all kind of going for me. Um, how do we get to, how do we have a, a foundation or platform that empowers us to be able to go into this space 
of critical disagreement with each other or maybe even just with yourself. It can be hard to just do this internally, you talking to yourself. Um, but in those relational spaces that we can make them productive, make them something that we're working together on, and that are deeply critical, right? That we're not pulling the punches on this stuff. I always joke that philosophers are troublemakers. We spend all of our time uh, focusing attention on the things we don't agree on, that we don't have consensus about, that are still unresolved, sticky questions that um, have a lot of weight to them and people get worked up about. And, and how can we work on that and make progress with it instead of having to be like, well, you know, what is it that they say, you know, when you're at Thanksgiving or Christmas or holidays, you know, your family gets together, like, don't talk about religion, politics, or ethics, or morality, or something like that. It's like, those are the things we really need to be talking about, and having, and exploring our disagreements. We have so much to learn from each other, and the process of going through critical encounters with each other, in, from my view, are also some of the most intimacy, trust-building kinds of spaces that humans can share with each other, and to lose out on those values um, makes me sad. And so I want to make that uh, not not a safe space. I'm, I'm stealing this phrase from one of my colleagues here, but a brave space. I've always liked her way of putting that. That's from Zoe Alshire. She's like, can't have can't have safe space. We've got to have brave space, because um, critical debate means we're going to criticize each other. But there's a way in which that doesn't have to be nasty, and we can support each other in doing something difficult. Um, and maybe you've had experiences like that in your life too that those people you're really close to, that you have a lot of trust with, they're the people that you can really put yourself out there and be vulnerable, and they'll be vulnerable. And you can even talk about your disagreements and be like, hey, we have different perspectives on this or different cultures or, you know, I really disagree with you about that. I think you're totally wrong about that. And that's not a threat to our relationship. Um, it's something, it's a way that we're uh, even more closely connected with each other. I'm starting to wax poetically here, but I'll have a lot more to say about this. But this is kind of where my lectures are going to be going in this first unit, is like, why do we want to increase our skills at this whole critical thinking stuff? Um, what's the meaning behind it? And I think it's important for me to talk about some of those things. And I, this is the other thing that makes me sad about teaching this class online, is that I will have less opportunity to hear from you about this. Um, but this is the kind of thing that if you've got thoughts and opinions about it and, and experiences and maybe even some hesitancies going into the class, like, please share those with me. I would love to have those conversations with you. Uh, what reactions you're having to the lectures I'm about to put out this week, um, love to hear about that. Um, so this is all going to kind of culminate, and in, in my next lecture I'll be talking about this code of intellectual conduct, which is a listing of the intellectual virtues, like James is mentioning here. Uh, he's, what does he have here? Uh, intellectual patience, intellectual humility, intellectual courage, intellectual independence, intellectual tolerance, and self-awareness. Um, those are great intellectual virtues. There's 12 more that we're going to get here that kind of overlap with some of those. There are many different articulations of these so-called intellectual virtues. I'm really partial to this one. We'll actually be using this text for the informal fallacies unit at the end of the quarter. Um, but I, I like this approach to it, and I'm going to be talking through this quite a lot. It's a very short document. It's just two and a half pages. That's it. Bam. Um, but I'll be spending a few hours uh, unpacking this. And I also have up on um, in our Canvas site here another document called the Supplement to the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I gave a conference talk about teaching this exact class um, a couple years back, and uh, people who listened to my talk, some other philosophy educators were like, hey, I'd like to hear more about like what do you do with this and what does it actually look like? And so I actually typed up a, a sort of set of lecture notes about the things I like to talk about with that I will be talking about with all of you about uh, cashing out each of these principles and what I think is significant and noteworthy about them. Um, with 12 short principles, you'd be amazed at how much content that's here. This is a nine-page document. It's at 4,500 words, so I will not be hitting all the beats here in my lectures this week. Um, but if you want to dig deeper with it, I recommend taking a look at this document, and feel free to ask me questions if anything doesn't read off the page here. But there's a lot to do here. Um, this is kind of the human side of critical thinking, and I always am fond of saying, like, when we're debating, what are we as people? We're not just, like, 
computing robots. We're, we're not just rational computers, um, but we are bigger people than that. We, are, we have a lot of, of other aspects to us other than just our analytic, rational, logical stuff. And that's actually very, very relevant to um, what we do as truth seekers and in our reasoning efforts with each other cooperatively. And um, that ethical, relational sensitivity is something I'm definitely going to be bringing to the table here. And you'll see creep up in the lectures even after we get through this first unit. Um, and it's something I encourage you to have on the radar, too. Um, everything that we do, we need to do with humanity. That's a little vague of a statement, but we'll cash that out. I'll, I'll, you'll hear very quickly what I sort of intend by saying that. Um, so that's some of where we're going to be going here um, this next week. So uh, I in terms of what you can do this week, please read the syllabus. Um, do that. Uh, send me any questions you've got. Post Actually, if you've got questions about the syllabus, make discussion posts about them because probably other people are going to have questions about that too. So do that. Um, take uh, the, there's a quiz here. Yeah, the checkup on the introduction and orientation materials. Um, a lot of this is about testing what I'm talking about in this video lecture right now and just like locking in certain things to make sure you're on the same page um, and knowing how things are going here. Um, there's a code for watching this video um, that I'm asking you to, uh, so I should give you a code word. Oh, man, I need to think of a code word. Mm. Oh, I'll think of a code word in a second here. Um, check out the intro lecture. Uh, I'm going to be giving um, another, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. The intro lecture is my next lecture. I will be recording that tomorrow at 12.30 to 2.30. If you want to show up live to it, I'll be making a announcement post um, at around 12 o'clock leading up to that with a link to a, a Skype link because the school here uses Skype. Um, so we've got a, a business Skype account. You can log in to Skype using your Bellevue College credentials. And then there's a hyperlink. You can just click on the hyperlink. I'm going to post in announcements. And that should take you to the uh, video conference chat room. Uh, if you have any troubles, text me. I'll be watching for texts from you and I can guide you through the process if you're running into any trouble with that. Um, but I'll be lecturing on the Code of Intellectual Conduct tomorrow. So uh, if you get a chance to read that, please do that. Um, and then uh, that's what we'll be doing in this first week. If I get through everything on tomorrow's lecture, which it's very possible that I don't get through everything, but maybe I'll be very efficient with my lecture. I like to go on tangents, and like I said, there's so much cool stuff to talk about with the code. I can sometimes overdo it a little bit. But um, maybe by <clears throat> when I'm going to do the Thursday lecture, we'll get started on some of the Chapter 2 stuff. So if you want to also read ahead here with Understanding Arguments Chapter 2, recommend it. Um, you can you can start moving ahead there. Um, and I think that's it. I'm going to pause the video here to just kind of do a checklist internally to make sure I'm not forgetting anything to talk about and I'll think up a code word for you. Um, so I'll be right back. Uh, just a moment for you, but some more time for me. Okay, I think I've I think I've gone over everything. I've tried to make sure this video wasn't super long, so um, hopefully I haven't glossed over anything too much. But if you have any questions and comments about this video, um, and about the syllabus, like post that in the discussion boards too, and I'll get you your answers. Um, the code word is charity. It's my favorite principle on the code of intellectual conduct, and I'll talk about why in my lecture tomorrow. Um, but uh, charity will be the code word. So when you open up this quiz for the website tour code, uh, it'll just ask you, like, put in the code word. You just type in the code word, put in charity, hit send, and you'll be good. And I just give you credit for that um, to reward you for spending the time to listen to me yap away about everything that I'm going to be doing on these video lectures. Um, the Yeah, I just want to emphasize a little bit more here about how being a better critical thinker is not about just being able to win intellectual wrestling matches, about this sort of competitive sport of it. And there's some people who definitely approach it that way, even some philosophers. And it's always a pity to me um, because it really isn't more productive that way. Um, 
even for uh, I know that American culture's got this kind of uh, philosophical conceit about how like capitalistic competition pr brings out the best, right, and pushes people to their best. Um, I'm not buying that argument. Uh, to be honest, if you want to debate that with me, we can do that. I teach business ethics every spring, so I'm very familiar with that argument um, and that perspective, and we can talk about that. But um, especially for something like critical debate, I don't think it works this way, that our best chances of getting at the truth is when the people that are engaged in a debate just like go at each other like cats and dogs and are disrespectful and abusive, and that's that's not making the cream rise to the top or anything. I don't think that that happens. Uh, I think it really gets in the way of the best productive stuff. So I, I sometimes like to joke that teaching this class makes me feel like an arms dealer. Maybe you've heard before, like, knowledge is power. And it's true. And you're going to pick up a lot of skills here, a lot of tools in your tool belt this quarter from the material we're going through. Lots of tools. We've got a lot packed into this quarter's curriculum. Um, and what you do with it, I don't get to control. I mean, that's you. It's your, your free person. And you'll make the choices of what you want to do with it. And a lot of the tools from the quarter uh, can be used for evil, um, <laughs> what I would count as irresponsible use. Um, and they can be used to amazing um, effect, too, for really idealistic uh, purposes, um, ethical purposes. So um, you'll see more of me cashing that out over the next lecture or so. Um, and throughout the quarter. But that's part of why I want to sort of talk about this big picture stuff and spend spend a good amount of time on this before we get onto the nuts and bolts of thinking about why we would do it this way. And especially if you have these reflective thoughts about like, what are the advantages of developing your abilities as a critical thinker? And what are the risks, especially the risks? Like, what would you be worried about? What would make you mean feel like, yeah, I don't know if I, I think this is the right way to live, if this is really the way I want to go or the way I'm going to choose to go? Um, what are the concerns that you have. I always love to hear from students about their experience with this kind of stuff. Um, but um, I definitely come into the class thinking, uh, uh, assuming, uh, you know, erring on the side of assuming that you probably don't have a good experience or have had some bad experiences with critical debate, um, with open disagreement, uh, where people are arguing with each other. Um, I hope that you've had some good ones too, um, but I'm not taking that for granted. And I'm not going to just assume that. And uh, hopefully um, we can explore and frame up and present a robust vision here about how it can be something that's positive and it doesn't have to be something destructive and negative. So um, we'll talk more about that very soon. So I'm very excited to get to know all of you. That's another reason I really encourage you to reach out. Um, I like uh, get, get developing rapport with my students, so hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. So. I'll see you around.